Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk, and this is episode 153 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I had such a great discussion with Sarah Wingerath Schlanger for this episode. And Sarah is from Tuesday's Children, which was founded in the wake of 9-11 to serve families affected by that tragedy in 2001, including the 3,051 kids who lost a parent that day. Sarah tells us they are one of only three nonprofits started because of 9-11 that are still operating today, and she fills us in on who they are serving today and how. And I think you'll be especially interested in the book Tuesday's Children put out in 2011 on the 10-year anniversary. The book is called The Legacy Letters, Messages of Life and Hope from 9-11 Family Members. And in it, there are letters from relatives of a hundred of the individuals who died that day, including from teens and young adults who were kids when their parents died. It's a it's really a powerful way to hear directly from our young people and from others about how the loss of their loved ones on September 11th has affected them over that first decade after their loss. Uh, before we jump into my discussion with Sarah, I wanted to let you guys know some news from here. So first of all, we have a terrific lineup of shows returning for the fall. I will be sharing discussions with several different widowed parents who had complicated situations and relationships when their spouses died, which is something that I've been asked by listeners to talk more about. And also, I am looking forward to talking with one of the co-authors of the late Dr. Ruth's new book about reducing loneliness. When I heard the U.S. Surgeon General say in an interview recently that over three-quarters of all single parents today are experiencing loneliness, I knew that I needed to speak with them. And that number, three-quarters, that's all types of single parents, so I have no idea what the number might be if they looked only at the widowed parents in that group, but uh, my guess is it would probably be higher. And in addition to all that, lots of other great shows lined up, including for Children's Grief Awareness Month, which is coming up in November. All right, so that's all the news from here. Let's get on with the show. Support for this podcast comes from BetterHelp. You can talk with a licensed professional therapist online, anytime, anywhere. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Widowed Parent to learn more and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Widowed Parent. I hope you'll check it out. My guest today is Sarah Wingerath Schlanger. Sarah is Senior Director at Tuesday's Children, which was formed in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, and which provides healing and resilience for for military families of the fallen and families affected by 9-11. She's joining us today from Snoqualmie, Washington. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jenny. It's a true honor and privilege. Well, I've been looking forward to talking to you. And I, and I should say for listeners, Snoqualmie is like practically in my backyard. I mean, not quite, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, I'm in Redmond and so we're not too far away. Um, yes. And I know we've we've gotten together and talked all about the good work you guys are doing. So um, I've really been excited to bring your work, your organization's work, Tuesday's Children's work to my listeners, because I think I think you guys are doing some great stuff. Um, and as you, we're. Jenny. Yeah. And so um, I want to get into how you guys got started here soon. But as this is being recorded, it's shortly before September. I think as it comes out, it will probably be on September 11th, mm-hmm. which It's crazy for me to think it's been 23 years um, since 2001, September 11th. I was living in New York when it happened. Um, So it all felt very up close and very real, even though I myself was not like in lower Manhattan or anywhere near the Trade Center or the Pentagon or the or Pennsylvania, Shanksville. Um, And I didn't actually lose anybody that day. But being in New York, it felt like everybody was like either first degree, you know, lost somebody or second degree like you knew someone who knew someone who lost somebody or was missing and yeah and my neighbor was like a firefighter in the suburbs he was sent down to help um you know all these things so it just felt really close and really scary and really terrible and I was looking at your website before we hopped on here and I've learned that 3,051 kids lost a parent that day yes plus of course Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so many Sorry, others Jenny. who lost other yeah spouses and other family members, um, lots of loss and grief um, that day. And so I was wondering if you could tell us about how Tuesday's children got started. Thank you for the question. And I think it's important to kind of remind your listeners um, that 3,051 children lost a parent, but that captures the youth. That doesn't necessarily capture the young adults and all that might be my age mm -hmm. um, who would have lost a significant role model, a career supporter, someone that's in your corner, um, as we know. Parenting never ends, and um, having the support of your parents is something that is such an honor and a privilege and um, certainly impacts so many ages and stages of young adults, youth, and adults themselves. Mm -hmm. So Tuesday's Children was founded right in the aftermath of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. We were formed by a collective of family and friends that said to themselves, how can we stand in for all of these children? in a way that doesn't replace their parent, but ensures that all their skill building resources, opportunities, community, network is not also lost with their parent. And we asked ourselves, where can we stand in a gap of what was not already being done? Because there were hundreds of nonprofits started after 9-11. Mm. I'm really proud to tell you we're one of three left standing today, directly really? focused on the 9-11 families. Wow. And a lot of that centers around the fact that we stand in a unique space. We're about post-traumatic loss, but most specifically post-traumatic growth. Uh -huh. So looking at the long-term impacts of having a post-loss journey means that we want to make sure that they're not just surviving, but they're thriving. And with that comes a great deal of programs and peer-to-peer -peer dialogue um, that really allows us to elevate what they're already doing in their communities and in their lives and ensure that they are leading lives of purpose, one that are healthy, strong, um, but understanding that this is a lifelong effort. And sometimes you might need to reach back and lift someone up. And sometimes you might need to be lifted up yourself. Um, there's no um, requirement for our services. You can step in, step out, however it meets your needs. And I think it's really important, too, to remember that we don't do anything at Tuesday's Children without the advisement and the guidance of our Family Advisory Board. We continue to evolve with the needs, which obviously have changed some from 2001, 2002, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you, Jenny. Being here 20 years, 23 years later is hard to believe. Um, but one of the reasons we're still able to stand strong in our commitment and steadfast in the family's efforts that we have is that um, we've expanded our mission to serve military families of the fallen and the 9-11 responders who are facing life-limiting conditions. And some might not realize this, but the number of those that have passed away due to their time at Ground Zero or other recovery efforts um, has now eclipsed the number of those killed on September 11th. Really? Okay, so you're talking mm -hmm. about the firefighters and the police officers and the first responders who were on the ground searching through the rubble, trying to find survivors, and in the process acquiring terrible health conditions from the exposures there. That's absolutely right. And there's there's even more to that, Jenny. Um, there are those that might have been volunteers at the site providing important services. They might have been with the Department of Sanitation. They might have been with a construction union. Unfortunately, there was so little rescue and so much recovery mm. it went on for years in terms of trying to give the family some sort of closure oh, okay. um, with remains gotcha okay and so there were people pulled into that effort over a period of years who then may be needing support now all these years later um, from health conditions they developed doing that work yes yes uh -huh. absolutely okay. yes okay um and you know, there are health programs for those that are responders in their own way that ha that came to the site, whether that be Ground Zero, Fresh Coast Landfill, Shanksville, these different areas that, that had this need. Um, but there's also their families. 
they they made a tremendous amount of sacrifices along with their 9-11 responder. So because we support the entire family unit, because our methodology is centered around building um, health and wellness within all those in the family, um, we we also serve the 9-11 responders families. And for mm-hmm. children that are um, very aware that their parent might be on, you know, at the last season of their lives, Tuesday's Children is very important. I see. Okay. Okay. And then you're also serving people who, people and families who didn't have a connection to 9-11 directly on that day or in the recovery efforts we're just talking about, but other military connections somehow? Yes. Um, I can make that kind of tie in in terms of where we are now to our original origin story and that Tuesday's children recognizes the ripple effects that Tuesday, September 11th was. So if you remember the amount of individuals that quote, answered the call and did so in their military service, that's that's why we pivoted in this way. I want to be really clear that nobody has for, been forgotten in the expansion of our mission, but it just means that we're able to bring these programs that were so essential to the 9-11 families, to the military families of the fallen, regardless of circumstance of loss, um, regardless of status, whether you're a veteran, you've been out of the service for three years, and you know you you have passed away from cancer. If you served our country honorably, your surviving family is eligible for our resources. Okay, and I think I think you're referencing. I do remember um, immediately after 9/11, there was a surge in people joining the military, wanting to help in some way, and re- you know their response was to join the military and serve in that capacity post 9-11 where they had not been in before then. Correct. But also our military took a a quite um, proactive (laughs) stance in in, um, what we were able to do um, in post 9-11 and how that changed the landscape. Um, If 9-11 were not have had happened, maybe they wouldn't have been in harm's way in the way in which they were through combat or various deployments. Okay. Okay. All right. So any families who've had somebody um, serving in the military in the last 23 years here, um, whether or not they're still in the military and whether or not they died like directly related to the military service or some other way. Um, Mm -hmm. If they have served in that capacity, then they're also eligible to be um, involved with you guys. Yes. And um, I think a lot of people that are in this military space understand that there's a great amount of PTSD, which leads to um, an increase in suicide. So I want to make it very clear that a big part of why our mission does not have um, a requirement about circumstance of loss is because um, we're we're very much responding to the reality and the needs of the military families of the fallen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about some of the services that you guys yes. do offer, you know, today, presently, um, mm-hmm. to the families that you serve. Yeah. Sure. So um, a big part of what we do is um, in providing skills and resources and direct services such as mentorship. So finding a dedicated adult role model that will spend um, eight hours per month working with a young adult between the ages of six and 18. It's a friendship model. So it's focused on fun and it's focused on self-discovery and it's focused on resiliency building. Um, We're similar to some of the other mentoring programs that your audience might be familiar with, but we're more rigorous in our training and screening because you're working with a population that is statistically more vulnerable and that we want to be very um, steadfast in our commitment to child safety. And we want to make sure that our volunteers understand the traumatic loss and they understand that if you're not prepared for this commitment, and you might come in and out of a child's life, you could do more harm than never having been in the child's life. Mm-hmm. Um, our, our mentoring program very much focuses on a continuing education and, and supervision and satisfaction so that these long-term matches are exactly such. 
we well exceed the national match average because we understand that each of these children have had their own loss experience and we do not want to add to that in any way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also have mentorship in a different form. That's through our Career Resource Center program. Um, and this is really important as we talk about 23 leaders, 23 leaders, 23 years later of Tuesday, September 11th, <laughs> forgive me. Um, there were 109 women pregnant on 9-11 that lost their partners and their husbands. So um, you have to remember, we now have 22-year-olds that are asking themselves, what is my career trajectory? What do I want to do with my life? And so our Career Resource Center is not only vital for the widows and widowers that are going back into the workforce, maybe having put pause on their professional mm -hmm. development because mm -hmm. of the loss of their person. But now these young adults that lost their career mentor when they lost their parent, we did a lot um, in the past that continues like take our children to work day when all these kids um, from Tuesday, September 11th, were alone in the classroom because their classmates were with their parent at work. We uh -huh. put in programs so that we could give those kids a shadow opportunity just as their peers were experiencing, but with someone that um, was a volunteer with us for the day or a corporate partner. Gotcha. Um, okay. I think the Career Resource Center is um, a wonderful way for your audience to think about ways in which they can get involved. There are people that um, might not necessarily have the time to give to a long-term youth mentoring experience because it is more of a um, long-term robust commitment per month. However, the Career Resource Center is a great way for someone that is a career professional. It might just take one phone call. You, you know, an agent of change comes in many different shapes and forms. And so it's great to be able to have um, as many career advisors as possible at Tuesday's Children. Mm -hmm. We also have um, our peer-to-peer -peer support groups, so regular meetings that are facilitated by professional trauma experts that build dialogue and, and have different themes, um, you know, whether it's getting through the holiday season, whether it's um, your feelings of having um, just witnessed another secondary incident, um, really being as... as um, mindful as possible um, that important therapeutic interventions are very much needed um, throughout a grieving process. And then um, almost out of order, Jenny, I apologize, but the one of the things that we do when we're first getting to work with a family is invite him for invite them for the really fun things. Come with us to a baseball game. Come mm -hmm. with us to a sporting event of any kind. Come with us to a picnic. Um, meet us at the zoo. Um, these are our opportunity to have them build trust with our staff, to have them learn about what services that might meet their needs today, what might meet their needs in the future. Um, and then be able to sit and be in community with one another. Um, we've heard from so many families, and I remember you and I talked about this when we had a chance to get lunch together. It's really helpful if you're new on your lost journey to see someone that might be a little further out to be able to see um, what's in <laughs> front of you and what could come. Um, and to say nothing of the fact as we talked about before, being able to have that circle of care. And you might be a 9-11 widow 23 years out and you might say to yourself, you know what I think? I think I could really help a gold star widow and being able to talk to them about my experience and, mm. and my children's experience and how what what we learned and what are some things we might do differently. Um, that, that opportunity to have these um, opportunities of mentorship really within the peer community is so valid and, and appreciated. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one other thing that I think people don't always realize is that you don't necessarily have to jump in with two feet with Tuesday's children and say, I'm going to be a mentor necessarily, although we'll never run out of our need for mentors. You could do things like sign up and do the 5k in in memory of, of those lost on 9-11. Mm. Um, we have some really great opportunities to kind of build the brand, 
become ambassadors, especially in this area of Washington, where we're not as close to the epicenter in the New York metro area, Mm -hmm. you know, reminding people that the loss is still felt, not just on one day of the year, but 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. And how can we um, let those families know that they're still appreciated and supported and loved? Yeah, yeah. That's terrific. And I, something you said just got me thinking, you know, mm-hmm. and you said you and I are both in Washington and we're, I don't know, 3,000 miles, maybe not quite away from the epicenter of the Trade Center. Um, mm-hmm. Do you serve people in all 50 states and or what's the kind of geographic, you know, opportunity for people to get involved or not? Yeah, um, I think one of the things the pandemic taught us is that we can provide our services Um, just as well um, digitally. Our mentoring program has kind of the hybrid opportunity that's in person and online, or some of our matches are strictly online. Um, There's, so the answer to your question is, if you're a family that's eligible for our services, anywhere in the globe, you would be eligible, you would Mm -hmm. be welcome in our, our community. If you're looking to be a volunteer, there's always ways in which you can help. Uh, We're very much looking at kind of the scalability of Tuesday's children and understanding where the um, different saturations are. Um, It wouldn't surprise you to know that we have a lot of families in the Fayetteville, North Carolina area. We have a lot of families in the San Diego, California area. We have a lot of families in the Colorado Springs area. Um, Because of the military bases in those areas. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, But much like what we saw after September 11th, a lot of families um, might move back to where their support system is. Mm -hmm. So um, we can't stay hyper local. We need to be looking at how we can still offer services throughout the country. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, Something you mentioned, and now I can't remember exactly what it was, but it reminded me of this book, which listeners can't see, but I'm I'm holding it up. It's called The Legacy Letters, Messages mm-hmm. of Life and Hope from 9-11 Family Members, yes. um, collected by Tuesday's Children, a book that mm-hmm. you guys put out, I believe, 10 years after 2001, yeah. 10 years after mm-hmm. the event, and 10 yes. years after all these people lost someone. And You're I wonder exactly if you could tell correct. us... Yeah, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the book and kind of what people could take away from it. Sure. Um, Well, I think there's a a lot of things that are so amazing about this project that we did. Um, The first of which is that this is 100 letters of Mm. loved ones. We actually had 220 or so submitted. Mm. So... um, We also have a self-published book of those that were not picked up by the publisher in this book that is, um, that tells more stories. But basically, Jenny, this book is, again, a hundred letters from 9-11 family members, whether they lost their son, their husband, their father, um, their cousin, their best friend, their fiance. Um, I often say it in the masculine sense because three to one men to women were lost on Tuesday, September 11th. Um, Mm. yes. Um, but you know, it, the relationship to their person is so varied in this book, but there's a lot of themes. Um, and one of which is the idea that they are the living legacies of this person. Um, they are carrying them with them every day. Um, they're finding ways to turn their pain into purpose um, with, you know, the the learnings, not only from their memories, but of those that have become part of their ecosystem that are telling them about their person and reminding them what they see in them um, that should not be forgotten. Um, we talk a lot at Tuesday's Children about how um, there's a lot of things in our world that are really important. There's memorialization, there's the bricks and mortar that is um, the 9-11 Memorial Museum, really important. We want to educate future generations. We never want anyone um, to, to be forgotten. But this is our opportunity for Tuesday's children 
to publish the voices of a hundred people that are saying, you know, here's where I am 10 years later. This is how I miss you. This is how I'm honoring you. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my favorite letters in here is by Lauren. And Lauren asks, would you be proud of me? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Yes. Well, and you know, as I read some of these letters, actually, the, the very first one is um, Jennifer Lechak, uh daughter mm -hmm. of somebody who was lost. And it says right here, age 16. And it starts out, dear, mm -hmm. dad, dear dad, I was seven years old when you were killed. I'm now 16. I've spent mm -hmm. more than half of my life without you. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got about a page and a half here of of some thoughts. Um, ending with, most importantly, I will always carry you in my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I, you know, look through here, there's, there's kids who never met their parent because as you mentioned before, some people were pregnant with babies who were not born as of September 11th, but were born after, mm -hmm. um, people who were small children or teenagers when they lost their parent. And so they have varying amounts of memories and things that they wish they remembered or some of them said that you know their father or mother was so young that they had fuzzy memories some people remembered things very vividly they were a little bit older and one of the things that i always encourage my listeners to do you know in general is to try to understand the perspective of their their grieving kids right it's yeah. a, it's a different loss right so like in, in my example i have two kids so all three of us lost the same person dennis but we lost a very different role. I lost a spouse and they lost a parent. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different experience, even though it's the same individual. Not that one's, you know, easier or harder or whatever. It's just different. And so I always think that it's useful as a parent to try to understand the perspective of grieving kids. And I think one of the things that is a tremendous service in this book for even, you know, people who have grieving children and their family has no connection to 9-11 to and to the people in this book. The opportunity to hear directly from these grieving kids and teens and young adults what their experience has been, I think, is a tremendous service and something to really encourage widowed parents to, to take a look, to try to better understand. It's not like your, any one kid is going to be exactly the same as any kid in this book, but I think it gives a variety of perspectives on how the experience has gone for all, all these kids which can, I think, be useful to those of us today who are trying to raise grieving kids. I think that's really well said. Um, the average age of children that lost a parent on Tuesday, September 11th is eight years old. Mm. Um, so they are now in their, the, the, the largest majority is still in, is now in their early 30s, mm -hmm. and they might be becoming parents themselves and thinking gotcha. about the intergenerational trauma um, yes, as you said, this book was published on the 10th, but what's it going to look like on the 25th, which is just around the corner? Ooh, are um, you guys going to do another book? Maybe that's question. top secret. I don't know. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be a dream? Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, but, um, there is so much to be learned from this population. Mm -hmm. I often say I'm, I'm a better mother. I'm a better wife. I'm a better daughter. Um. I'm a better sister because what the families have poured into me in terms of their resilience and, and their stories of, of um, their post loss journey. It's, it's incredible. Um, but I, I think the other thing that I would encourage your listeners to consider is that um, so many of the children that are grieving I, I shouldn't even say so many, but it, it looks different in each child is the better way I should say that. Mm. There's regrief, regrieving that happens. Mm -hmm. So it's grief is not, as you know, and so many of your other guests have explained, it's not a linear process. How a child grieves is much different than how an adult grieves. Regrief could be the smell of your dad's cologne. It could be, you know, going to prom could be the first dance at your wedding. Um, these are life moments where um, your grief is going to feel just as fresh as it did then. And so to have parents remember 
you know, like you said, the relationship to the loss is different for them, but developmentally they are different. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And with each developmental milestone and advancement and their cognitive, emotional, intellectual um, capacity, that grief is part of them too. Such an important point. And I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, because that's not something that was intuitively obvious to me, uh, you know, a long time ago before I started learning about this mm-hmm. stuff, right? That sure. because kids' brains are still developing, and obviously, a, you know, a six-year-old has a very different cognition than a 16-year-old, for example. And right. somewhere between six and 16, like around the time of puberty, they've got, you know, mm-hmm. their cognitive capacities are taking a huge leap and that that often triggers um you know re-grief to this uh, you know the new things they're starting to understand that they didn't understand before because they just you know were small children before yes and i think that is all well said and bears a reminder to your audience that things like secondary loss or cumulative grief or what we saw in the pandemic with disenfranchised grief that's going to take its toll too Mm -hmm. um The last thing I want is to use our time together today to talk about um, kind of the darkness, maybe, um, of of loss. But um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't remind people that this is not easy. Um, There's no prescriptive method. Um, This is not something that is cookie cutter. This is not something that will look the same from day Mm. to day. Mm. Um, But if we remind ourselves that we're all, um, if there's grace in that, grace for yourself, grace for your children, um, educating yourself on kind of what is in front of you is really important and using a resource such as the legacy letters to hear from others that have walked this path. um, I think not only is it a great way to remember the 2,977 lives lost 23 years ago, but it's another way to kind of educate those that go in front of us, um, you know, how how we cannot let um, this loss, um, take any more from us that it's already taken yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and one of the you know another sense i got from reading some of the letters in this book from the you know i picked for myself some of the ones who were you know younger widowed people who had you know what appeared to be you know children or teenagers at the time of their loss and now they're writing 10 years out and you know the sense of how they are carrying on Right. And mm-hmm. and I think you talked way up at the beginning about, you know, resilience and post traumatic growth and all kinds of things. And I yeah, I think it's interesting too for people with you know, that are not ten years out to to see from this variety of people what is life like ten years out, you know? Mm-hmm. The ups and downs and and how they've chosen to to continue on. And and what the sense I got was, you know, they're remembering and they're honoring their loved ones and they're also like I've got three kids and we're going to soccer Mm -hmm. and ballet and we're doing this and that and we miss you every day and we love you. And I want to tell you, Mm -hmm. you know, your son is is terrific with this and that and your daughter is so Mm -hmm. excited about this and that. And like, you know, and really like their portrait of their lives 10 years out, I think is really um, interesting and and worth looking at. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you feel that your kids feel that 10 years out of the loss of Dennis. It's it's um I'm glad that we had the opportunity to give these families a platform. Mm. Um, but I'm so grateful to them that they trusted us yeah. to take the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think myself or Brian Curtis, the editor, or even Peregrine, the publishers, um, understood what was gonna come back. Um it it, it it's 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 it really is in, in my mind. Um, a masterpiece and and anyone should be reading it. Um, and I, I encourage anyone to um, take a minute and and read what they can. it's it's really incredible. Yeah, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes um, to Thank the you. book and yeah, and then of course, to your website so people can mm-hmm. can connect with your services. Um, yeah, and I think it's terrific. I mean, I, I gather that you guys have 
have this sort of longer term focus. Um, you know, you're still serving 9-11 families 23 years later, and you're serving other families who I suppose are in varying degrees of, or varying, um, you know, lengths since time of loss. Uh -huh. um, and I, I think you guys are taking this sort of longer term view um, in support, which I think is, is, is terrific. And it's very different, right? There are some organizations, I think, that focus on short term, um, sort of immediate post loss support. And there's right. a time and a place, I think, for both. Um, and so it's great to know about these resources and things you guys are doing. Um, and even like you pointed out, you know, those kids who were maybe born shortly after 9-11 and are now just starting to enter the, the career world, for example. And the fact that it's like, oh, one of my parents is gone and that parent would have been giving me guidance now as I'm mm -hmm. figuring out my young adult next steps, right? And you guys are there to to step in and provide some support in those things. I think it's terrific. I think one thing that uh, grieving parents or widowed parents really get is uh, the concept that we step in when the casseroles stop coming. Ah, um, that's a good and, tagline right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we support crisis situations, but we're not about immediate crisis response. Mm. Um, we step in when you're ready to find out what's next. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is a really amazing pivot point to be at. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's um, terrific. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Good. Okay, gosh. Well, we could keep talking about this um, all day. I'm looking forward to releasing this on September 11th mm -hmm. and thinking about the fact that it's been 23 years and how crazy that is. It simultaneously seems like, you know, a few years ago and a million years ago. And I am assume, you know, your people probably <laughs> think similarly. Just like, yeah. you know, even, you know, Dennis's loss seems like two, three years ago and 20 or more years ago, like at the same time. Yeah. And I don't have to try to reconcile that, you know, it's fine. Like it can just be weird. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> mm -hmm. It is what it is. But um, anyway, I'm glad to hear about what you guys are doing and your mentoring programs and your other support programs and the populations you serve. Um, I always like to ask my guests at the end, if you could say one thing to widowed parents, what would you, what would you say to them? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think I would tell them, you know, put your oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your children. Um, healthy parent means a healthy child. And, um, the more you can do to, um, pour into yourself is, is going to come back to you in spades. Um, I think one of the things we learn from the families of September 11th who are still struggling to this day is that youth felt like they had to parent their parent. Um, mm. And there's no judgment in that statement. Loss makes people um, really, you know, it shakes them to their core. Um, but being able to uh, remember that there is an incredible human in your little person, um, wherever they are, 6, 16, 26, um, they're going to teach you a ton. And the healthier you are, the more wellness you have, the better you're both going to be. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, I think that's a great place to end. So mm -hmm. my guest today is Sarah Wingerath Schlanger, who is Senior Director at Tuesday's Children. So Sarah, where can listeners find Tuesday's Children if they would like to learn more and connect with you guys? Tuesdayschildren.org is our website. We're on all of the social media channels, including LinkedIn. We'd love to have um, more participation on those various um, communication channels. I'll also point out for those that are wondering, you know, what if I am a victim of a mass violence situation? Or what if I'm a community advocate that wants to ensure we are bringing back trauma responsive care to um, those that are post loss? Um, Tuesdays Children Heals, H E A L S dot org is our secondary website, and it's a codification of 20 plus years of lessons learned. Um, and I would bookmark it on your computer and check it back at the end of the year because that website is going through a huge revamp and we'll have probably 90% more resources very soon. Amazing. Okay. Well, I will put that website and your main website both in the show notes as well as, of course, the link uh, to your book. 
so that people can connect with you and pick up the book and have a look. Um, so Sarah, this has been so great. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you, my neighbor, Jenny. I'm so grateful for all you do for our shared community. You're a light. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Sarah Wingerath Schlanger as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 153. And if you're finding the Widowed Parent Podcast helpful, please consider supporting the show. It's easy. Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash widowedparent. That's buymeacoffee.com slash widowedparent. As always, thank you for listening. And until next week, remember, you've got this. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.